very much for your time and your thoughts. I want to ask you some questions later on about uh, Navalny, uh, Alexei Navalny, the person that the West uh, seems to be uh, idolizing, and uh, President Biden certainly did. Uh, you have some facts about his history and background, which caused you to refer to him as a traitor, and I want to get there. But before we do, uh, what is happening in Rafa, uh, in Gaza, as we speak, the last city, town, municipality, whatever you want to call it, that seems to be standing in Gaza? Murder, uh, straight up murder, um, genocide, war crimes, um, uh, human depravity, um, evil. Um, that, that's what's happening. The Israelis are in the business of killing innocent civilians for the purpose of um, driving 1.6 million people out of Gaza into the Sinai Desert, uh, depopulating uh, Gaza um, so that they can terminate Gaza as a Palestinian entity. Um, so this is what's happening. This isn't war. Uh, now, Israel will say, you know, we're going after four Hamas battalions that are in Rafah. Well, then why do you drop bombs on civilian tent cities? Because you know there's civilians there. You're dropping the bombs on the cities. By the way, the civilian tent cities that you dropped leaflets saying, go build a tent city in Rafah, that's a safe place. You'll be safe there. So 1.6 million people did so. They're there. Then you starve them out. You tried to starve them out, Israel. You uh, deny them humanitarian goods. You deny them food, medicine, horrific living conditions. But they stay there nonetheless. And then you drop bonds on them. Then you kill them. You slaughter them. You murder them. Um, you know, and, and, and guys, this isn't Hollywood death. This isn't, you know, the bomb goes off and somebody, oh, dramatically falls on the ground. And her, this is ripping bodies apart. Bodies of children, bodies of women, bodies of pregnant women, bodies of old men, innocent people. Their bodies are being torn asunder, ripped into tiny little pieces by the Israelis uh, for the sole purpose of terrorizing, uh, intimidating 1.6 million people into fleeing for their lives. Um, Israel is trying to create the conditions where they say, you have no choice. If you stay in Rafah, you will die. And here, we'll kill 150 more of you tonight just to prove that point. And the world's doing nothing, nothing. Silence. In the United States, we're supposed to be this moral entity. You know, we're supposed to set the moral standard. Silence while this murder is taking place in our name with our weapons by people we call allies. So this evil that I say, you know, resides in Israel, it resides right here at home in the United States. Any American elected representative, indeed any American citizen who tolerates this, you're evil. Straight up. Just acknowledge it. Um, some people who agree with you and me many people watching this program uh, rejoice uh, in the uh, political uh, eggshells that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is walking on. But you have cautioned that while he has a lot of personal legal problems and, and uh, political uh, deficits and probably will go uh, at some point, he's likely to be replaced by somebody who has the same attitude towards the Palestinians that he does, that there would be no effective change in Israeli policy. Here's a, a statement just yesterday uh, from Benny Gantz, a former Israeli general and leader of the opposition, uh, opposition in the Knesset, but what you're going to hear him say could very well have been written by Netanyahu. Cut number one. The world must know, and Hamas leaders must know, if by Ramadan hostages are not home, the fighting will continue everywhere to include Rafah area. We will do so in coordinated manner, facilitating the evacuation of civilians in dialogue with American and Egyptian partners and minim to minimize the civilian casualties as much as possible. So I guess... Um... The only way the IDF can be stopped, the slaughter can be stopped, is by some outside force. It's not going to happen to, with domestic politics. That's the opposition. Right. No, this is this is 100%. Look, Israel is more from a nation that, and, and, and I know, I, I mean, I continue to learn, Judge. I don't pretend that I know everything about everybody. I, I perhaps romanticized uh, Yitzhak Rabin. I, uh, I had the opportunity to sit down with some people who, 
knew Yitzhak Rabin and, and were part of the policy and they educated me about what he was really about. He, he wasn't the perfect peacemaker that, that I, you know, remember, he, but he was trying to do a process that was heading in that direction as imperfect as that process was. There's no Yitzhak Rabin's in Israel today. They're gone. They've been pushed out, been silenced. Israel today is a nation composed 100% of uh, radical Zionists who believe in from the river to the sea. I mean, it's amazing how they condemn the Palestinians for making this chant, but it's okay for Israel to, to say it, and they say it openly now. So yes, you get rid of Netanyahu. Um, maybe you can get some um, you know, people to come in who will not be as uh, vigorous in uh, supporting the illegal settlements in West Bank. But the bottom line is, if you're in Israel today, that means you tolerate the policies of Israel. You tolerate the anti-Palestinian policies. You don't want a Palestinian state, and you support this ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people. So yeah, you get rid of Netanyahu, you're just going to replace him with somebody who doesn't carry the same legal baggage domestically. But I'll tell you this, they're all war criminals, and their day, of, the day of retribution will come. If not at the hands of the Palestinians, Hamas or Hezbollah, at the international community. Israel is becoming a pariah nation. Brazil just severed diplomatic relations with Israel, and I think that uh, more nations will do so as well. Because, again, what Gantz was saying, uh, we will try to minimize civilian cat. No, you won't, Benny. You're a liar. You slaughter them. You don't care about them. You don't view them as human. And we have the videotapes to prove it. Uh, is it true that there's one army division in the south uh, about to slaughter Rafa? Uh, and three in the north. And if they're there in the north, what are they doing? Planning to invade Lebanon and and, and attack Hezbollah? Well, they're, they're in the north as a deterrence against uh, Hezbollah. But the bottom line is there's not enough of them. Um, you know, Hezbollah has been planning a war with Israel for some time now. Um, Israel doesn't have enough military force to stop uh, Hezbollah. The the, the unit in, in, in Gaza, yes, they're getting ready to go into Rafah. But remember this, Judge. Um, the Israelis said they, that they cleared out Gaza City a long time ago. That's in the north. Why are they still there? Why are Israeli troops still dying in Gaza City? Because Hamas is still there. You haven't defeated Hamas. In Khan Yunus, the Israelis claim that they've driven Hamas out of there. But just the other day, 23 Israeli troops were killed in an ambush. And more die every day in other ambushes. Why? Because you haven't driven Hamas out. Israel thinks that they can go into Rafah and drive out a civilian population and defeat Hamas. They're wrong. Hamas is underground. The Israelis acknowledge that they only accounted for about 20% of the tunnels. Uh, that's 80% that are left full of Hamas fighters who still have the ability to come above ground at a time and place of their choosing and kill the Israelis. This isn't going to go the way Israel wants it to go. And the longer they, they press on this issue, the more the international community is going to uh, rebel against them. I don't know if it's enough to get the United States to end up doing the right thing because this war could end right now. Again, I'm just straight up telling you that if Joe Biden picked up the phone and read the riot act of Benjamin Netanyahu and told him that, um, you know, all American aid will cease, that we will insist that, you know, we will sanction Israel. Um, we will make the APAC register as foreign agents. Um, you know, we will deny aid to Israel. We will no longer give Israel the backing of the security council. So that now the security council can pass a chapter seven resolution, which allows nations to use military force against Israel. If that's the way Israel wants us to go, then let's go that way. Stop killing Palestinians. But we don't do that because Israel has bought the U.S. Congress and they bought the presidency. And you'll never get American politicians to um, show that kind of spine. Who calls the shots in Washington, Biden or Netanyahu? You know, indirectly Netanyahu. I mean, Netanyahu has, is an abrasive personality and there's a problem between Biden and Netanyahu. But there's an entire pro-Israeli network in Washington, D.C., uh, lobbyists, etc., um, both overt and covert, because remember, the Israeli lobby includes the United States Congress that has been bought for, not just the people who lobby Congress, but there are active Israeli agents in the Congress of the United States. If they were do if they were people advocating for Russia the way these people advocate for Israel, we'd have arrested them a long time are, ago. Are you saying there are Israeli agents who are members of Congress? There's an Israeli, there's an American congressman who wears an Israeli uniform. Because he served in the Israeli army, and after October 7th, he put the uniform on and went to Congress, and everybody said, that's okay. It's well, that can't be okay to wear the <laughs> military uniform of a foreign country in the, in the House of Representatives. If it's an Israeli uniform, of course it's okay, because we, we give Israel a pass 
or everything? If the IDF cannot defeat Hamas, how can they possibly rationally think they can defeat Hezbollah? Well, first of all, the IDF knows that they can't defeat Hezbollah. They know that. Uh, their strategy will be to inflict so much harm on Lebanese civilians that Hezbollah faces a revolt from uh, in, in its rear area from the Lebanese. That's their only hope because they will not defeat Hezbollah on the battlefield. Hezbollah is not only not going to allow Israel to take the war to Hezbollah to try and drive them back to the Latani. Hezbollah said if the next war will be fought in northern Israel. Hezbollah is going to northern Israel. The battles will be fought in Kiryat Shimona. The battles will be fought in other Israeli towns and villages in the north. The battles will be fought on the shore of the Galilee. Uh, and Israel knows this, and they also know that if that's the battle, they don't have the military force to guarantee victory. And no matter what, once Hezbollah is roaming around northern Israel, capturing villages, forcing the Israelis to destroy these villages in order to recapture them, that's a domestic political loss for Israel as well. It's a nightmare Israel doesn't want to go down. But uh, and, and the Israeli the Israeli military knows this. The problem is Netanyahu and Benny Gantz and the other politicians, they have to posture. They have to play tough guy. They have to, you know, convince the Israeli public. Because remember, all these guys were in power on October 7th when Israel got their butts handed to them by Hamas. Right. And so they they ha they can't afford to have anybody perceive them as weak. They have to posture as if they are the end all when it comes to strength and military strategy. So they're going to posture, but they all know what will happen if they go to war against Hezbollah. Have the um, uh, settlers, the Israeli settlers who've just stolen land in the West Bank, left, or are they still there? No, they're still there. They're they're. I mean, some have left. There's been uh, some 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 uh, settlers. Some Israelis have fled. I think the number is up to five hundred thousand Israelis have fled since. But these it happens all the time during the Gulf War when Iraqi Scud missiles were landing on Israel. A lot of Israelis left uh, left Israel and, and went to live in Europe and the United States to get out of the way of the fighting. There's a large number of people doing that, but this is actually empowering the um, the, the 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 settlement mentality. Uh, for instance, uh, you you see that settlers have taken over the crossing with Egypt, um, and they're not allowing humanitarian goods to fly flow in. That Israel said they would allow that the United States negotiated for. They're just shutting it down, and nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's removing them. The Israeli settlers now are having meetings <coughs> where they're talking about repopulating Gaza with Israeli settlers, which is a violation of everything. But the, the settlers are in control. The settlers are the living manifestation of these radical Zionist policies. And there's no, there's no blocks. There's no checks and balances. They are literally out of control. They are running the show inside Israel. They're calling openly for genocide against the Palestinians. And unfortunately for the world, the Israeli Defense Force appears more than happy to give them what they're asking for. Um, I'm going to show you a portion uh, of an argument uh, presented by an a uh, Palestinian ambassador to the uh, International Court of Justice. And in this argument, he uh, shows five maps of Israel um, going back to 1947 and up to two weeks before uh, October 7th. I think you'll appreciate seeing this if you haven't seen it before. Allow me now to show you five maps. The first one is historic Palestine. This is the territory over which the Palestinian people should have been able to exercise their right to self-determination. Instead, the General Assembly recommended the partition of Palestine, ignoring the will of our people as shown in the second map. With the Nakba that ensued, over two-thirds of our people were systematically and forcibly expelled by Israel. And three-fourths of Palestine became Israel, as shown in the third map. This was the start of the Nakba, the disposition, the displacement and replacement of our people the denial of rights and discrimination that continues to this very day. In 1967, Israel then occupied the remainder of Palestine. And from the first day of its occupation, 
started colonizing and annexing the land with the aim of making its occupation irreversible. It left us with a collection of disconnected Pantustans, preventing the independence of our state, as shown in Map 4. Israel wanted the, uh, the geography of Palestine, but not its demography. So it kept pushing our people out, out of their homes, out of their land. Here is the fifth map. It was displayed by Israel's Prime Minister to the General Assembly last September. He called this the new Middle East. This is no... So there's no... I mean, this is, these are historical facts, which are essentially not subject to serious uh, intellectual dispute. Nor is that fifth map subject to any misinterpretation as to what Netanyahu intended. Scott, two weeks before October 7th. Do you think he looked the other way, knowing it was coming, wanted this excuse? Um, I mean, <laughs> it's a conspiracy theory. Um, it's one that um, would require him to be far more evil and hateful than um, than can one can possibly imagine. You know, there will be a commission. The intelligence will have to be gone through. Um, what we do know now is that the Israelis were collecting the evidence of an impending Hamas attack. Um, so the, the reports were being written. The Israelis were saying, the people on the front line were saying, this is happening. And then the Israeli government undertook every measure possible to not prevent this from happening, uh, up to and including the night of the attack, uh, being receiving reports saying they're coming across the border now. They're coming. We got it. They're coming in a couple hours called the alarm, mobilized the soldiers, and the emergency uh, council, cons consisting of the Minister of Defense and, and all these other security people, said, no, we're going to sleep on it. By the time they met in the morning, it was too late. It, the attack had begun. So I think there's plenty of justification to have a commission open up and, and to look into it. But, you know, you can call me naive or whatever, but that is a level of, I, I know the Israelis are capable of genocide against the Palestinian people. but um, it, it, you're still going to have to convince me that the Israelis are capable of genocide against their own people to carry out this. I'm not saying it's impossible, but my brain right now just can't uh, can't register, not from a logical standpoint, but from just a pure um, emotional standpoint. It's it, it would blow my brains to 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 learn that the Israelis sat back and allowed this October 7th to occur, knowing that so many Israelis would lose their lives. Um, it's it's just mind boggling, but stranger things have happened. Yeah, here's a very emotional moment uh, at the uh, International Court of Justice. It's it's not the same fellow. It looks a little like him, but it's another a Palestinian ambassador. I believe it's the Palestinian observer, since Palestine is not a country recognized by the UN. The Palestinian observer at the UN. Uh, who breaks down emotionally uh, in the midst of his uh, argument to the court. The state of Palestine appeals to this court to guide the international community in upholding international law, ending injustice and achieving a just and lasting peace, to guide us towards a future in which Palestinian children are treated as children. <sighs> Not as demographic threat in which the identity of the group to which we belong does not diminish the human rights to which we are all entitled, a future in which no Palestinian and no Israelis is killed, a future in which two states live side by side in peace and security. Are the um, American calls for a two-state solution a fig leaf?
Of course they are, because we have no intention of... Look, the Biden administration has been calling for a two-state solution since they came in. Uh, but it, it's just a throwaway argument. We we did everything but pursue a two-state solution all the way up to October 7th. Now we say, oh, now we really mean it. But we don't, because look, Tom Friedman wrote a, um, a piece... Uh, an op-ed piece in the New York Times talking about the Biden doctrine. He said, look, this is this is it, a two-state solution, but it's a demilitarized state with no rights. That's not a state. Um, it, 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 it's artificial. We don't, look, that speech broke your heart. You want to, you want something else? There's a, there's a tape right now of um, the six-year-old girl on the phone to the rescuer or four-year-old. I mean, she's a very young girl. And she's scared. She's in the car with her dead parents, her, de her dead uncle, aunt, dead cousins. And she's begging for them to come and get her. Please come. I'm scared. It's getting dark. What happened? So, you know, so, you know, listen to that. And if you're a father, if you're, if you have, if you're an uncle, if you're somebody who has, you know, a, a, a niece of that age, Imagine that being her. Imagine it being your, your your daughter calling someone, begging for help. Please come and get me. She hasn't done anything wrong, but the Israelis used her as bait. They used her as bait. They set this up. They were monitoring this phone call. They allowed the Palestinian medics to come in. They, they gave them the route. The medics got within 50 meters of this girl. They saw her in the car, and then they killed them. The Israelis killed them, and then they killed her. Mm. They, 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 they set them up. If you see that and you don't cry, if you see that and you don't understand how evil the Israelis are right now, I mean, that, that, that man's speech broke your heart. But listen to the voice of this girl as she's on the phone. The tank is in front of me. The tank is coming to me. The tank is very, very close. I'm scared. And then the tank killed her. Let's uh, switch gears. Before I let you go, and while I have you, uh, President uh, Biden has been condemning President uh, Putin personally for the death of Alexei Navalny. Chris, do we have the uh, tape where the uh, reporter asks uh, President Biden about comments he made about Navalny three years ago, uh, and the president uh, responds? You warned Vladimir Putin when you were in Geneva, of devastating consequences if Navalny died in Russian custody. What consequences should he and Russia face? That was three years ago. In the meantime, they faced a hell of a lot of consequences. They've lost and or had wounded over 350,000 Russian soldiers. They've made them a position where they've been subjected to great sanctions across the board, and we're contemplating what else could be done. But the, the, what we were talking about at the time, there were no actions being taken against Russia. And that look all has transpired since then. Was Navalny uh, an intelligence asset of MI6 or CIA or both? Both. Uh, Navalny was a uh, political operative. Uh, he was groomed by the CIA during a Yale uh, internship. Uh, he was supported in Moscow by a network of non-governmental organizations and other entities who received uh, money covertly from British intelligence. Uh, he participated in three coup attempts against uh, against Vladimir Putin. The first one was the elections of 2007-2008, where the United States attempted to carry out a color revolution to prevent uh, the swap that Putin and, uh, and, and Dmitry Medvedev were making, where Putin was basically had run, had served two terms, uh, was going to switch over to prime minister, Medvedev would become president, and then at the end they'd switch back. That was the goal. Um, the United States tried to disrupt this to prevent that from happening by carrying out a color revolution where Navalny played an important role. Then after that failed, Navalny got selected for this Yale program, which is really nothing more than a front for the National Resources Division of the CIA to groom, train, recruit, and then deploy him. He got deployed back for the purpose of uh, disrupting Vladimir Putin's attempt to return to power in 2012. We have Navalny's deputy on film with British intelligence saying, I need 10 to $12 million to make this happen, meaning to disrupt Putin's return to power. There it is. Um, you know, <laughs> that's treason. That's, that's, that's treason. So, you know, that's what um, Navalny did. And then Navalny, 
uh, got involved in trying to disrupt the the 2021 um, effort um, as well. This, you know, this led to well, this is Navalny is the great um, uh, nationalist. Here he's comparing uh, people from the the, the Caucasus as cockroaches and um, and uh, flies. He says that uh, the way you deal with cockroaches and flies is with a fly swatter and slippers. But sometimes you have bigger pests, and then a Muslim comes in and he shoots them. He says the solution is the the handgun. He called Georgians. My wife is from the Republic of Georgia. He called them rodents. Rodents. My wife is not a rodent. Her family isn't rodents. Georgians aren't rodents. Navalny is an ugly nationalist. That's the reality. Now, we tried to put lipstick on this pig and turn him into, uh, you know, the symbol of democracy, but he was never a Democrat. He was always a disruptive force, trained, funded, and directed by the CIA uh, to undermine um, Russian government, not undermine Russian democracy. Nothing about Navalny was democratic. He never garnered more than 5% support nationally. He could never have won an election. His job was to be disruptive, purely disruptive. And in that, he did a good job, but he was a traitor nonetheless. Well, Scott, thank you very much. I know this uh, was emotional uh, earlier, but you, you showed your big, uh, beautiful paternal heart. Uh, imagining this young girl being somebody else. We'll, uh, we'll get the tape and, if we can uh, post it on this venue, uh, we'll do so. But my dear friend, you're a great man. Your analysis is superb and, and courageous and grounded in fact, and I'm deeply grateful, as are the many, many, many people watching us now for everything you've just said to us. All the best.